introduction to the Deep Frontier project. And um, I will start in here just by telling a little bit about the background for it, because in a moment we'll be out there looking at the facilities, discussing what they are and what they can be used for. And afterwards, we'll be back in here and hearing some of the work that's been done there. So I won't start doing this, just giving you a very short overview of the, of the project and some of the reasons why the project is like it is. <clears throat> so again, I mean, as discussed all the time, when you work with anything that is related to crop production, uh, there's a continuous need to increase uh, food production around the world. Um, there's also um, a continuous need to limit the amount of land we put into it, the amount of resources we put into it. So where can we try to find more resources that can be used for crop production and to increase crop production in a sustainable way? And then think about it out here and everywhere else where we have a hectare of cropland. There's a root zone, there are crops using the resources there, but beneath the root zone there are more water, more nutrients right and right on down the that could be tapped into. <clears throat> so that's, you can say, the mindset of, of, of what we are trying to do. It's, it's of course very clear that the amount of resources down there, water nutrients, will vary a lot depending on where you are, <clears throat> and also uh, the chance to actually reach them for various reasons, and that's some of the things we are going to discuss in, in the next days. When you look at what is taking off most agricultural land out there? Um, common annual crops, you have the ones that are called the, the big four the rice, which is a special case, but wheat, maize, soybeans, annual crops with limited root depth. In many, many cases, the, their root depth is limited by a short time, so in many, many cases, there are more soil that could have been rooted if they had had different. Uh, Characteristics. So, what we wanted to do in this project was to <coughs> challenge the depth frontier of the crop root systems. The project includes a lot of uh, different um, uh, topics. We have been developing the facilities we are going to look at. We have been working with developing methods because when when we are discussing why we know so little about deep roots. It's because it's so difficult both to get there, access them, to, to, to study them, but, uh, and, and also how to get information uh, out of them when you use uh, it. So, so a lot of methods. We have been looking at plant species because, and I'll come back shortly to that, one of the main variables is the root depth of plant species. We have even within uh, common crops, there's a lot of difference, and if we try to look wider with the perennial crops or so on, we can find uh, crops that can go much deeper. And not only look at the, the crops and cropping systems, how we can develop that, but also look at what are they actually using down there. Then uh, we know that when growing in soil, plant roots, they have friends out there, they have enemies out there, so there are diseases, there are nematodes and so on, attacking the roots, weakening the root systems. But there are also microbes are helping the roots. There are also uh, 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 a fast developing research area into other soil microbes that, uh, that uh, interact with and sometimes improve root growth or function. And with the global agenda on um, climate change and so on, of course, it's, it's so obvious when we look at deep roots and we look into their ability to put carbon down in the soil, if we have deeper rooted crops, we'll put more carbon down. And what is the fate of this carbon? We know a lot about if we put crop residues into the topsoil, what will happen, what are the dynamics of loss of carbon. And so on. But what when we put it into the subsoil, where a lot of conditions are different? And it's well known if you look at the age of carbon in different soil layers, the deeper down you get, the older the carbon is. So in some ways, we have an idea that it has a longer lifetime. But uh, but that's uh, a complicated story. But that's that's uh, that's the main element uh, of of the project. Where did the where did we get these ideas, and where did may say I, I get this obsession with deep roots that uh, I've been 
working on. And, and I'll tell here just very shortly about my background for wanting to do this from my own research, of our own research, and, and of course inspiration from us, and I'll take our advice report as uh, an example and thereby also present them. So, um, I started working with roots very shortly after I started in research. Working with cover crops grown to, uh, for the purpose of taking out nitrate from the soil so it wouldn't leach out to the environment. And in the first study I did on that, we compared a number of different species, measuring root growth with mini rhizotrons down to a meter span. And the first thing we could see was that, that the depth development of these species varied, I would say, dramatically. From the slowest to the fastest, it was a huge difference. Um, one of the species had a lot of roots to, six, uh, to, to a meter after six weeks. So in its early growth, dense roots down to this depth. And when we looked into the soil sampling, soil analysis, and, and looked at it, it was clear that there was an effect of these differences in, in root uh, depth development. We could see that we didn't measure that deep, we measured down to 100 centimeters, but in the deepest soil area analyzed, there was a clear relationship between root depth and soil height rate. So there was something to, to go for. So the, the, the conclusion was that root development could be deep. The one meter we measured <coughs> to was not enough. Uh, root development varied strongly, so there was something to work with and we could see that it mattered. So, over uh, uh, later years, uh, one of the things that was done was to develop the mini retrotron system and, and our field set up so we could work to two and a half meters instead, and study not only cover crops, but, but roots and nitrogen in relation to cover crops and to a, long, uh, a range of main crops, but also to rotations what, what happens when we put this into a, a context of a rotation, because a, a, one, a, a crop is of course a part of a, a system and, and, and uh, we may affect uh, things in many ways there. So, and looking into that, these two and a half meters under Danish conditions, it's deeper than the maximum root growth of many crop species. But not all. We, we have seen crops that have a lot of roots all the way down. So we are not outside the rooting zone, uh, for all crops at least. We can also see that the nitrogen uptake from these layers, in this case between one and two and a half meters, is high, uh, but potentially high, and we have seen examples where uh, the difference between a shallow root and a deep rooted crop was like 100 kilograms of nitrogen or more per hectare under a meter, and where all the interesting story was in, this, in the data we got from below a meter. The top meter didn't tell us anything uh, of, of much interest. So, so continue to see the importance of this. And looking at these data, crops, crop rotations, we could see that this is an important tool if we want to improve nitrogen use efficiency, both for the crops and to avoid that this nitrogen is running out to the environment, um, that, that these differences in root data are really important. A few, uh, two, two slides here. One is just here showing comparison from three years, comparative study, winter wheat, spring wheat, and following what you see on these lines is simply estimates of average maximum rooting depth over time. Um, when we look at these depth development rates, the spring and winter wheat have exactly the same depth development <coughs> rates in terms of millimeters per day degree but the winter wheat have so much more time to develop that reaches approximately twice the rooting depth of the, of the spring wheat. Uh, and also in this case, we could see that this allowed the winter wheat to use a lot of deep nitrogen that was clearly out of reach for the spring wheat. So just among such common crops. Another example, uh, as I said, I started out working on cover crops and that was different species, but in, in, in our part of the world at least, sowing cover crops into cereals, like indicated on this image, is one of the ways we can uh, establish them. So this is a field where we have spring barley, and together with spring barley, 
in April, we had uh, different cover crops on the zone. And, and what you see there is root profiles in November from two of the common species that have been used for this purpose, ryegrass and white clover. Um, and you can see they have a lot of roots in the topsoil, some down to a meter, very little below a meter. But we can try to look into, could we, could we grow other crops there? And you can maybe see on the image that there are different crops here. And, and three of the other species we sowed in in the same way, did like that. And you can see, at least for two of them, uh, it's very difficult to see any declining trend in root density with that. Uh, down to two and a half meter, and again, they were sown, this is measurements from November, they were sown in April, they grew until August under a zero crop, so they grew very little, so most of this growth is from, from August to November. So it really shows crop species and deep rooting is something with a huge variability. <clears throat> yeah, so... Going to the Deep Frontier project, the idea is it must be possible to take this. <coughs> um, looking into, well, some of the crops we know already, but all other crops and cropping systems. And the work until this, in, in this group, has been focused very much on roots and nitrogen, but of course, now we would look, want to look at roots and various other resources, not least water, which on the world scene is, is probably more important in, uh, for deep. Deep roots are more important for water than for nitrogen on the world sea. Um, yeah, and yeah, all the challenges of this. But we also have, of course, it's not all from from own background and, and inspiration. Many others have done a lot of, of work on deep roots. And for this project, we had four people volunteering to be. Uh, Advisory board, uh, three of them are here today. Philip Hintinger could unfortunately not be here, uh, but the three others are here. And just to mention their work, how that also uh, inspired, and uh, this is my very short um, summing up some of what I have seen in their work that, that really was inspiring to, to what we have been doing. And Philip has been working a lot, you can say, zooming in looking at what are the roots doing down there, how are they, what is their, their rice sphere effects, what, how do they interact with uh, the soil, the soil particles, uh, the rice sphere uh, biology. Uh, we have worked with mineral weathering, because normally we look at what are available nutrients, but here we've been looking into how can roots actually contribute to the weathering of the minerals they meet in the soil. Um, so, uh, and that's some of the things we know. I mean, just knowing that the roots are down there is one thing, but knowing how they are uh, doing and performing is a very different thing. Another thing, uh, another example here is uh, Tim, and, uh, uh, here, who is uh, working at the Land Institute, where they are working on developing these uh, perennial crops. So instead of, of growing annual cereals, annual oil seeds, annual crops, maybe we should grow perennial crops. And I, I admire this work a lot because on one hand it's there's a long way from these from taking a wild uh, crop and say, well we can domesticate it. Like people have domesticated the, the annual crops over ten thousand years, so we can do that as well with the other ones. That's a, that's a huge thing, but it's also, I think, a major system disruption, a very interesting approach to, to this because, I mean, just the fact that going for annual crops made good sense for Stone Age people five, ten thousand years ago doesn't mean that that's the right choice for us today, and maybe we can do something about it rather than just stay uh, <clears throat> defined by the choices that were made for some very different reasons at that time. So, um, that's certainly an, a great inspiration. Another great inspiration here is John, that I worked with for, uh, for many years, and how to sum up the, the work very shortly in, in one slide. That's, uh, but, but, but I think what I find so inspiring is, of course, the great work with roots, deep roots and water, um, which in a dry environment like most of Australia is so highly important. But also the fact that 
combining great and what I would call often quite basic group studies with a clear, I mean, I, I said agronomist up there, that's how you describe yourself. Um, I put a picture of you out in the crop in there because you have this focus all the time. How do we use the study into roots to actually improve uh, improve crop production, the use of water in these dry environments? And I got my most recent lecture on it from the boss on the way out here, and it's always situational. <laughs> uh, and Alain, uh, who just have had this focus on studying roots very deep to depths that we don't even dream of here. I was cracking another root image from four meter steps just before, but uh, you can study roots in some environments much, much deeper and try to understand what are they doing down there and how are they affecting the, the whole system, the ability of the plants to use the water from it. I think, how deep have you been going? So it's not a competition. No, <laughs> it's not a competition, but it's an inspiration. It that's that's actually not because I think you was it you who made this term the truncated mind of root researchers. You measure down to a meter and assume what's below there is probably not important. You didn't make that assumption, and that's uh, certainly an inspiration. Yes, so that was to give you a background of some of all the thoughts that have come together in forming a project like this. And um, I think it's time to go out and have a